and we're live. Uh, <laughs> small hiccup there. Um, I jumped the gun, was waiting for the intro, um, but we're live. It's it, no matter at all. Um, Everybody knows the music. That's right. That's right. We can, we can bop along to it later. Maybe we can have a, have a redo uh, down the road. But um, thanks, everybody, for joining us for yet another Motor1.com ha- Test Car Happy Hour. I am Seth Mearsma, Editor-in-Chief. Joining me today, Jeff Perez, Senior Editor. Hello. Um, it's just the two of us, two, two editors and a load of cars and one bicycle to talk about. So we're going to um, keep everybody busy and on your toes. Uh, if you guys have questions and Gosh, I think you might this this week if we're uh, talking about the the, the drop shipped Chinese e bike alone. Um, please, wherever you're watching this, whether you're on YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you're seeing this video, you can leave us a comment, ask us a question. Um, we have got a uh, super producer and co-host of the Rambling About Cars, uh, uh, Chris Bruce, behind the scenes today. Say hi, Bruce. Hey, Bruce. Uh, he he would love to throw your question and comment up there uh, and and start a dialogue. So. Um, Jeff, let's start with you. You're back from a trip to drive something very exciting that we can't talk about at all right now. Uh, I can say what I drove. I drove the, the Mustang Dark Horse. Ooh. Um, I was in Charlotte, so that was cool. But yeah, I can't talk about it till Tuesday. The review goes up at two, Tuesday at 6 a.m. So uh, once you wake up Tuesday, you can read that. And then I'll probably talk about it next week. But uh, yeah, 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 we'll have to get because because we promised to I think Brett to come on and talk about Brett drove like all the other Mustangs right like he, yeah. he, he drove the um, the stock Mustang and Mustang convertible and GT um, yeah. and you just drove Dark Horse so maybe we can just have a Mustang nerd fest next yeah. week yeah yeah that'd be cool yeah um, but besides that what did you what were you driving what did you drive to the airport. <laughs> Uh, wow. Uh, something way less exciting. A 2023 Toyota Highlander. Um, Ooh. yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly an SUV you can buy. The, the Highlander, <laughs> the last Highlander I drove, uh, was right when it came out, right when this current generation came out. And I remember really, really disliking that car. Um, mostly for the infotainment system. It was one of the worst infotainment systems sure. that I think toyota had put out in a long time um but then uh the new infotainment system has since come out on the tundra and on a lot of the lexus stuff and the difference that it makes in this car uh basically the same screen i think it's 12.3 inches uh just that alone makes this car feel so much like nicer and cleaner and more updated because really it's not a bad suv like it's just a it's just kind of a an anonymous one in a in a category like in a segment that's pretty robust yeah. um but that tech's really good i really love that infotainment system super clean super crisp uh wireless apple carplay android auto all the fun stuff um and then on top of that you get a new turbocharged engine this one makes uh 265 horsepower now so definitely wow. not fast um but yeah. not slow either like it's it's a good amount of power and uh it's comfortable i mean we drove i loaded up five of my buddies and we <laughs> Drove up to mini golf, we're like an hour and a half away from us on uh, over the past weekend, and it was fine. It was totally like comfortable. It's got the Toyota Safety Sense 2.5 plus, so that's uh, lane centering, steering assist, adaptive cruise, you know, with automatic uh, braking and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's really not that bad. I uh, I think I've sort of come around on the High- Highlander a little bit. I will say that I still think I like the Grand Highlander a little bit better after driving that. Mm-hmm one um it's it's a it's a very different not very different but it is different uh it's a different three row it's bigger it's got more space the third row on this one is still kind of tight um but i shoved one of my buddies back there and he was fine so sure yeah all in all pretty good yeah this size i mean listen i was just as you were as you were giving us the rundown i was looking up um like highlander sales figures because you know like this is always a fantastically popular model it's one of these things that toyota does like it's been true of camry at many points like obviously during uh camry's um long long run one of the best selling vehicles in either in the country or in its segment even though um for those of us in kind of the enthusiast automotive press it's never one that kind of stands out for a lot of reasons right so right. i mean toyota sold 
Toyota's like over 100,000, 110,000 of these already this year. They sell about a quarter million of them every year, right? So an incredibly yeah. popular vehicle, super meaningful when they have an update and to have a new engine option like that and presumably better, at least slightly better fuel economy. What's the EPA rating on, on the new engine? Uh, good question. question. One thing I don't have. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> it's 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 probably better. I mean, it, yeah, sure. it, I think it was I think it was pretty efficient um, to begin with. Um, so I think it, it probably got a little bit better. Yeah. I didn't mention the color too. The pictures here that that color is really good. Uh, Cypress yeah. green with twenty inch chrome wheels. It looks pretty nice with that paint. The design is is fine. Like I'm not in love with it, but I also don't hate it. Um, and yeah, it's a it's also like a tweener three row so it's kind of like kia sorrento ish mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit bigger so it's it's not like grand highlander is more of like a direct competitor to telluride and palisade the bigger three rows the bigger unibody three rows yep. and this one is this one doesn't drive as big as those which is nice um and you still get that third row that like i said is not amazing but it's it's fine for one or two adults over a, a decent decent amount of driving so not too bad that extra seat back there if you can adequately stow it which i imagine in the highlander you can like this has always yeah. been sort of my issue with with like sequoia right that the third row becomes challenging because there's not a flat load space then you've just got extra utility right like you throw somebody your your buddy back there an extra an extra kid if you're hanging out with friends or family or something like that can go back there um and i think it's really useful so it is funny though right like we have evolved from like having sort of compact mid-size and full-size SUVs to having like kind of these weird micro segments inside of each one of those too with longer mm -hmm. wheelbases and stretched for more seating and some um uh stuff like that yeah um yeah Brian Gurney I think nails it with our first comment of the day Toyota's become the Olive Gardener Applebee's of the industry uh they are reliable and reliably mundane you'll never be surprised in a great way or a bad way just a safe bet I mean, I think that Brian, like directionally, I think that's right. Um, there are definitely times when I've been very surprised at things that Toyota has done. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Toyota always has some really exciting products too. On, and it's just the ones that everybody buys, they're very conservative with. So they don't develop Highlander and Camry, um, you know, uh, aggressively because they know that the market there is, I want one that's better than the one that I had before, but doesn't feel like a radical change that I'm not gonna like, you know? Yeah. And, and like, I think that's true of the, you know, the more traditional CUVs and the cars like Corolla sure. and, and Camry. And then you have the more fun stuff. I think Tundra is really good. And then Sequoia is even kind of cool as a, as a body on frame sort of thing. So yeah. Yep. And Olive Garden's great anyways. So <laughs> plus don't know. I don't like Olive Garden personally or Applebee's, <sighs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't refuse to eat if that was the, if that was the option, I guess. Yeah um well cool yeah so so uh that that <laughs> basically covers us um you want to know how much it costs yeah yeah i do know want to know how much it costs and i want to know oh we just got a hello hello sng hello um, um yeah, what's the sticker so on this beauty fifty thousand two hundred and ten dollars which is uh limited all-wheel drive with yep. the fancy paint and wheels, which actually the paint's not extra. The paint is uh, a standard color, hmm. which is okay. cool. I don't think I don't think the Highlander really has any extra color or any um, like add on colors. I think they might have one or two, but the green is is no cost. So that's neat. Yep. Um, and then it starts at like 48. Um, this oh, trim wow. with all wheel drive. So oh, it's a little. Okay. Yeah. 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 The base model, I want to say, is 30 something high 30s. So. It kind of varies. I mean, the limited is nice, and then you can still go up to the platinum, which I don't really know why you would. I, th I liked the interior of this. I like the leather. It's got kind of all the features you want and need. So I don't really know why you would need to go up um, to the platinum. But I mean, if you really want to go all out in a Highlander, you can, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, we're not looking at the exact vehicle you have, but this is pretty much the exact trim, right? So exact spec, same yeah. same interior. Um, it's got the captain's chairs, which are really nice. The, the the seating position on this is weird, and I know that's one of my like annoyances that I always point out whenever whenever I'm driving. Right. But like the 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 cushion is really narrow, so it feels like I'm sort of falling off the front of the chair, mm -hmm. and I can't lift it high enough. It, it has an adjustable setting where you can lift the front bolstering 
um, like up and down. But even in the highest setting, it still feels like I'm sort of leaning forward a little bit. Um, yeah. That's my only complaint with the comfort. Actually, I have the exact same feeling. So I was recently, and we didn't talk about it on the podcast. I'm, I'm eventually going to have a small story on it on the website, but um, we did family vacation in a new Sienna, um, the top trim of the Sienna mm. all-wheel drive which is fantastic. Like not, not brand new by any stretch of the imagination, but just as a thing to like throw your family and all your stuff in was really great. I had that exact same issue. And it's one that like, as soon as I sit in some Toyota products, I, it's like it, my, the muscle memory comes back because you feel like you're always bracing yourself a little bit. Like you're sliding just a little bit forward. If you yeah. want to go as low as I need to go being really tall. Right. So mm -hmm. it, it never feels like the bottom the back and bottom sink down far enough. It's just the front of um, front side of the cushion that tends to sink down. So yeah. Um, interesting choices and all these sort of like, I always have issues with, or not always very often have issues with Ford headrests, uh, Toyota seat bottoms, you know, things like that. Just, yeah. just somehow carry on. But um, overall, yeah. Inoffensive, uh, reliable, I'm sure over time and the, and the real factor is like, will it hold its value over the, the a long lifespan, especially at that increased price point? Um, mm -hmm. Clearly Toyota probably thinks that's the case and everybody knows yeah. they can charge a little bit more uh, for, for vehicles today. So still 50 grand, man, that is a lot. Yep, um, those are expensive. Well, we'll jump from one um, expensive version of a kind of a commodity vehicle to a really expensive version of a truck, I guess. I, this is this is two weeks ago now out for me. I've got a few to ca catch up on. But um, so I was in the new the 2024 version, a new trim level of GMC's Sierra 2500, the Sierra HD. Uh, this is the Denali and the ultimate version of the Denali. So um, right off the bat, we're talking about a the sticker price on my exact truck was $94,835, um, which is just all the money. I, I suppose it's not because you can still go up bigger. You can still go up to the 3,500 and I'm sure that there are options that were not ticked here. So um, it's, it's smart bet that you can make this truck a hundred thousand um, dollars. This particular vehicle there are two there's a gas engine and a diesel engine this one has the 6.6 .6 liter uh duramax turbo diesel which makes oh shoot what is it 400 and let's see i have it 470 horsepower and 975 pound feet of torque um which is insane just a, a crazy amount of power we may or may not have lost jeff uh he's he's swirling yeah. a little we seemingly lost Jeff. I'll play co-host until he gets back <laughs> and ask you all the, the smart questions. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, hopefully we get just Jeff back in a second. But yeah, man, I mean, this is, I got to say, like the bottom line for me, forget for a moment the, the price, right? This is a hell of a truck. It is. This thing will do. It's, it's almost like I feel the need to call it a thing or a machine. Um, and Jeff's back as Hello. opposed to even a truck <laughs> because I really feel like this vehicle is is about as close as they come to being able to do literally anything that you want you want to do in it right yeah um i mean it's it's fast for something as gigantic as it is because of its aforementioned 975 uh pound feet of torque uh off the line it's it's taught like there's there's a lot of suspension travel like despite the fact that it's it's so expensive i actually think that this thing is going to be probably pretty uh capable um, climbing over stuff and certainly doing, you know, getting through muddy areas and things that you'd want to do in a truck. Um, certainly with the, uh, the, the right tires on it. Brian, Brian Gurney's back saying it's a lot of money, but for what they're capable of, it's not that outlandish. These consumer trucks are doing what commercial grade trucks could do not that long ago. These are just draped in leather and tech. Whereas before the seats were made from melts down milk jugs. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, um, we know that people are, are, first of all, we, we know that obviously um, Americans are still buying trucks and droves. Um, we know that everybody is getting used to paying more and more for, for brand new vehicles, including new trucks. That's been the case for a while. I know I've said it on this podcast before, but I remember being amazed um, at somebody's truck launch a decade ago now that the average transaction price had, had gone over $40,000 then, right? And that feels downright quaint at this point. So um yeah, I mean, you're you're getting an awful lot, but you're still, you know, you're basically financing a, a, a house in some places <laughs> to, to be yeah. one of these. Well, so. my problem with the GMC 
specifically, and I, I don't know if this is true of a lot of GMC products nowadays because they've they've done a really good job of sort of separating from the high end Chevy stuff. Um, but I just had that that Silverado twenty five hundred, and yep. it was seventy three grand. Uh, just you know, all the same stuff, cap- just as capable, same engines basically. Um, pretty nice inside, not like a luxury truck by any means, but but still really nice. I'm just trying to like, what's the justification? What's the extra twenty something k that you're gonna get on this truck that you want on the Silverado? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of times it's gonna come down to um, there's there's a lot of brand loyalty for GMC number one, right? Yeah. Like I. I grew up in an area of the country. I grew up in Western Michigan. I grew up in a General Motors family on one side. Um, and my uncles would occasionally like argue about GMC over Chevy, even though everybody <laughs> kind of knew that they were essentially the same thing, right? Yeah. There are some people who just want um, a GMC because they've had one in the past and they like it. I, I tend to agree, like especially when you're getting at the, the top trims, maybe the GMC is nicer overall. If we did like, we had two of them together and sat side by side and compared feature to feature. Um, But you're getting all of the important stuff you are getting in the Chevy version as well. Um, So it really just comes down to, to me, like, do you really like that GMC aesthetic? I guess. Right. Um, Well, one of the things too, is that they, uh, for a while, Chevy didn't have the split tailgate. Yeah. The multi-pro tailgate. And uh, and now they do. Even the base silver, uh, the 1500 has the multi-pro tailgate, which I think is is good. Like, I don't know why. I mean, I do know why they didn't offer it initially, because they wanted it to be like a GMC special thing. Yeah. Um, but it makes a lot of sense. So even here, like, you know, the multi-pro tailgate, you can also get that on the, the 2500 Silverado, too. So it is. Yeah, it's probably brand loyalty and leather and slightly nicer interior. But it's got know, that K is steep. It's a lot. And I don't know everything that's in this ultimate package, but I will say, hey, Sapphire, um, the yeah, the, those leather seats are really nice. It's got that kind of baseball stitch on it, um, which is really cool. It's got, if you like it, um, I sort of struggle a little bit with the interface of the software, but G- this uh, infotainment system is dressed up like w- what you would see in Hummer EV, right? Like it's got that mm, same yeah. styling, that same graphical presentation too very deep, like lots and lots of technological features in there, deep menus. I don't think that it's difficult to use. It's just not, it, it's not my favorite um, in, in the segment, I guess. Right. Um, but but again, getting back to like what the vehicle is capable of, uh, we had a, a comment a minute ago about like what people actually use it for. This this one has a, so this one is set up for a, goose, a gooseneck trailer. Mm-hmm. This vehicle will tow a maximum of 22,500 pounds, right, with, with said Crazy. trailer. Yeah, yeah, Brian, do 90% of buyers need this at all? No, they. I would say no. The, but the counterpoint is, like my parents might be a good example. My my dad and my stepmom tow an RV, a really large RV. Now he's got an older Ram Dually, an older, older Ram 2500 Dually that, that will do everything they need. Um, but they, actually, they just bought a new Durango. They would love this. They like the amenities. They like the leather and the mm-hmm. uh, the sort of luxury level stuff that you would find here. And they have a big need to tow a super, super heavy, really long trailer too. So um, so all of the stuff that's being offered here would be great. I don't know that they would pony up $95,000 to get into it, but I think that there are a lot of people who have recreational vehicles and boats and you know live in the far flung or wide open Western parts of the country who might. So, um, man. Okay. All right. Let me, let me catch up a little bit here. So we're, cause we've got a lot of comments. So I'm going to go back to Sapphire Bruce. Uh, if you want to throw her up, she says, Sapphire says, I have a question. What do you all think of the facelifted Audi S six for the EU market where Audi hid the exhaust and even worse, the 3.0 TDI. So, um, I don't, I, what do I think about it? Uh, generally speaking, I, I guess I'm not super up to speed with the with the new, the facelifted uh, S6 f- specifically for the EU market. Um, I don't know that I feel that strongly about it. There, there is a strong point of view about, about automakers doing quote unquote fake things with exhausts, right? Maybe we can, we can focus on that. Um, you know, putting finishers on tailpipes has often been a thing where they split into four. So it's kind of looks like a quad exhaust, quote unquote, but it's not actually, it's really a dual exhaust uh, or a single into a double or things like that. Um, Hiding exhaust, I guess, if it, if there's a functional reason of like kind of cleaning up the arrow, which could very much be the case. 
Um, sometimes routing the exhaust down like helps the the airflow over the end of the vehicle and that sort of, uh, um, I forget the name, uh, that sort of like tumbling area, that there's a turbulent area there can be helpful too. So I would say that if, if, whether it's Audi or anybody else, if they're doing something like that for a functional reason, then I'm a lot more behind it than if you're just doing it for a purely aesthetic reason, especially when you're trying to fake performance that maybe isn't there. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with that. I don't, I just, the, the S6, I mean, we'll talk about the S6 in a couple of minutes, but sure, like yeah. the facelift, I mean, I, I'm looking at the facelift now and it's pretty subtle and the, we don't have the, we don't get the, the TDI right in the U S so. right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So we're a little, we're, we don't know that one exactly, but, um, do GMC trucks use the unreal engine for their infotainment systems the way the GMC Hummer does? That's a great question, Brian. And like, that's one that's easy enough to look up, but I actually don't know. I know that they, what I was talking about is they're using the same sort of, um, on the, on the primary, the sort of center stack for the infotainment, there's a graphical style and kind of a logic to the, um, to the infotainment system that is shared between Hummer EV and the, um, the Sierra Denali that I was in. Right. I don't think that they do. I, I don't think that there's the same kind of because Hummer has like a very video game presentation of the vehicle when you're changing modes and things like that, too. That happens right in the instrument panel in front of the driver. Um, and unless I'm just totally blanking on, I don't remember that being the case with the um, with this year. But we can we can look that up for sure and let you know the real answer. Um, cool. All right. Well, uh, I don't know if we missed anything on the GMC or maybe we, maybe we were just naturally transitioning to, uh, to Audi, Jeff, since, uh, Sapphire is, is pushing us in that direction. Yeah. We could talk about Audi. Um, so they told me that I was a few, this was a few weeks ago when I drove it, they told me that I was getting the S6 and I thought, oh, they must've made a mistake. It must be the RS6 because, uh, I forgot the S6 like existed this is one of those cars that i just completely just was totally out of my you know like wasn't even thinking about it um but then i i drove it and i spent a week with it and i kind of love this thing like this is a car i think i would buy if i had this kind of money which is 91 grand as tested mm -hmm. yeah so it's definitely not cheap um but something about this car is really nice compared to like the m550 or um I'm blanking on what the other, like a Mercedes, like an E53, I guess. Sure, yeah. Um, and the E53 is also really good. But the, something about the Audi, it just, the design is really clean. It's not too sort of shouty. Um, it's got that just signature Audi look up front with the with the big grill and the slim headlights. Nice paint. Um, I don't remember the exact name of this paint, but it's their, it's their gray sort of paint that you see on a lot of their cars. Uh, really nice. And then this one is uh it has a 2.9 twin turbo 2.9 liter v6 so 444 horsepower i believe yeah yeah 444 horsepower and 442 pound feet so zero to 60 in about 4.4 seconds so it's decently quick it's it's not like um there's a there's a pretty serious gap still between the s6 and the rs6 which is, i think is true of the m550 and the m5 and you know yeah. the e53 and e63 um but I like the way this car performs a lot. That engine is really, really smooth. You get like a like a little touch of turbo lag up front, but once you're sort of in it, um, there's there's a ton of power always. So it's really this nice. Is, this is supercharged and turbocharged, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, that? it is. Yeah. 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 So yeah, you've yeah. got right. So you've got that awesome sort of like broad spectrum torque, like across revs. Uh, I've always really liked this motor. It's been a long time, or not a long mm. time. But it's been a period of time since uh uh since i've been in in this car particularly or, or that engine but i have very fond feelings for it um yeah. Sapphire says i mean i just wanted to know what you all think about the disappointment that's the eu market s6 s7 unfortunately we just it's not our disappointment to share <laughs> i guess yeah. because we're, we're we're based in the us and we we with with very few exceptions drive north american spec variants of the cars so even when if you read something on motor one um, dot com that says we were in you know Germany or or abroad to drive a vehicle. They're they're almost always putting us in in North American spec vehicles. So um, yeah. they Audi is Audi has hidden the grisly truth of the TDI version of this car from us. Unfortunately, we well, will I think the good 
Yeah. Well, the good thing too is we don't get those uh, those numbers on the back in the U.S. yet. What were the numbers that they were putting on the back of like? I don't know. I don't remember what it was, but they were putting some crazy numbers on the back for torque or something. Oh um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, sort of the sort of the um, Cadillac is doing the same thing too, where we're yeah, just yeah, alphanumerics to to throw at vehicles, so they've got to invent new stuff to to um, <laughs> give you the differentiation for them. But yeah, no, I uh, so so going back to your, like the the S six has always been a little bit of a. I mean, sleeper is the wrong word. I suppose it is kind of a sleeper too, but you're right. Like it's got the, um, you know, the S7 is a little bit more dramatic. The RS cars are obviously quicker. Um, the, the sort of plain S cars still offer a ton of performance. I and, and I feel like they're a better balance, a little bit of a car that I would want to own and drive every day versus one that, um, you know, I might want to have on a racetrack or for a weekend or um, for some other sort of more exotic pastime. Um, right. You know, this is a this is a really old school idea, though. This is a this is a uh, sort of um, mid-sized, like high-powered German sedan, <laughs> and mm. and that's just not a super popular um, uh, way of way of selling a vehicle anymore, right? Right. Yeah, this segment is sort of uh, not died, but it's it's very like it's not as robust as it used to be. Just in general, just sedan, you know, big sedans in general, I don't think are, are as popular as they used to be. Um, the Germans still do them well, so but but the S6, yeah, it sort of was like the under the radar compared to the other two that I think get more press. Um, but I like it a lot. I mean, and the 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 diff the big difference here I noticed between um, when driving the M550 is that the BMWs are really harsh sometimes. The suspension is just so rough, even the M Sport models. Um, but this one's not at all. Like you can really configure it, the driving modes. Um, you can really configure the driving modes to be, you know, really cushy, really comfortable if you're just cruising on the highway or pretty dynamic if you want to, you know, turn it up a little bit and, and do some sporty driving, which I think is nice instead of just making it all or nothing uh, like the BMW. So really nice leather seats. You get that red stitching. I think that's part of the design package or the sport package. Um, the two, you get the two screens still, which is the only thing I really don't love, the bottom screen for the the climate control stuff, uh, you really have to kind of like look down and see what you're doing. They do have the haptic feedback or the haptic feedback buttons. Um, that's like the signature Audi thing where you have to, you long press it and then it does like an actual physical click yeah. so that you know you've you know done it. That's neat, like in theory. And I, I like the way it feels a lot, but it also, I find myself going back and having to re-click things a lot of times because I'm, you know, driving and I'm just reaching and I forget that I have to sort of, hold it for longer. That's probably something owners don't really notice because they're probably just used to having to hold that click for a little bit longer. Sure. Um, but it's one of those things I was like, oh, I keep having to press this three times for it to work. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sapphire is weighing in again. And I think I think drawing a comparison, the, uh, saying that this car is a relative sleeper. So two generations ago, I think we're on the C8 generation of, the, of, of this platform right now. Um, mm -hmm. There was kind of a legendary car and, and absolutely a sleeper. The, the S six that had the, the, the same V 10, I think it's the 5.2 liter V 10 that came in the, in the R eight in the original R eight. Right. Which was a heck of a car. Man, I'm trying to remember if I ever actually drove that thing. I, I remember kind of lusting after it and reading it, reading the coverage of, of uh, the outlet. I was there at the time. I don't know that I was ever actually in it though. Um, but it would, it's that, that would be, I think that this, class of car becomes really fun years down the road because you're like oh that was actually really the good one sort of what we're talking about now like that was it's not the one that's going to command all of the enthusiast dollars and 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 you know be uh wildly expensive on, on bring a trailer although maybe the v10 uh mm -hmm. uh uh s6s would be but um but so they're it's a little bit more attainable and they're fun to have there's it's just kind of a fun space um, down the road. It's a little bit more difficult as a new proposition when you're, when you're talking about like, you know, you could actually have a lot more or spend a lot less, you know? Yeah. This would probably be a pretty good use buy in a few years. If they, you know, go down in price, they don't hold their value super well, which I don't think they will. Yeah. Um, but I, I bet they would be a good use buy in a few years. You can also, I mean, the sleeper look like I don't, <laughs> the black on black kind of aesthetic I think has died or was like a very, 
2010s kind of thing but i still, yeah. i don't know i think this car might look pretty cool black on black lowered like a yeah, little bit of yeah. a tune or something like that would be a really nice sleeper if you could afford it yeah yeah um totally um fun car like and again i think this is one that um like i would enjoy certainly having for a week or even a month this this feels like a good long-term car not that now not that we're throwing hints out to audi but uh you can just do do an awful lot of stuff in it so yeah um Cool. All right. Well, uh, what else do we have on the docket? We have a ton of things to talk about. So I'll, I'll save the I'll save the e bike for last, despite my um, uh, the subtext on my title today. <laughs> and why don't we talk about one of the, the probably the newest vehicle um, in terms of new to the market that that I've been in in, in quite a long time that wasn't on a first drive, um, just left today, and that is uh, Dodge's new Hornet, Dodge's new uh, compact uh, SUV Hornet. So. Um, this is like, let me just start by saying, and, and granted the, um, the Hornet that I had was in, God, what's, is it called? It's not Acapulco. Oh, well, Bruce is showing the blue one now. I, we need to, we need to get the, the yellow one. Cause the yellow one is really critical, but the, um, shoot, what's the name of it? I just had it. It doesn't matter. It's, it's kind <laughs> of the, a, a goldish yellow over black wheels. It was, it's mm -hmm. the, um, I, I think it's the hero color for the launch of the vehicle. And it's um, it, just getting all kinds of attention. Our my my house, like my garage, is on an alley, so my neighbors always see like all the cars that were coming in and out. Um, here you go, thank you, Bruce. Um, and I I don't know if it, this had been in that blue or if it had been in you know it's available I'm sure in like gray and black and stuff like that. that anybody would have paid any attention to it at all. But in this color, um, lots of looks, lots of questions about what it is. Um, and, uh, people are, were, were generally really interested in it too. Um, yeah. another thing I found just aesthetically is, and, and again, just to remind the people at home, I, I live in Michigan, I live in Southeast Michigan. And then I drove this to the West side of the state where people are very familiar with, you know, Dodge Chrysler, all of the former FCA and current Stellantis brands that aren't Italian. Right. Um, nobody had any idea that this was a Dodge, yeah. no clue. Because of the because of the hash mark logo, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the or whatever they, I, what, there, there probably is a name that I'm I'm forgetting or missing for that for the new the two stripes logo, but nobody had any clue that this was a Dodge. Yeah, I think I mentioned this a while ago when we were talking about it at one point. Where this is the first Dodge we've ever seen with that logo, maybe or, or yeah. like historic models. But yeah, they haven't used this the Challenger, the Charger um the um durango none of them use this hash mark logo like as the main badge yep. so i think that's an interesting choice is it a good choice uh i don't know because like you said i, I don't think a lot of people know what that badge is but i guess it's like a a, a fresh you know step and they're going to do that moving forward hopefully. yeah so. i mean dodge might bring kind of a weird brand equity to this segment with this kind of vehicle right now right like dodge people know dodge for trucks and for big big suvs and i'm not positive that they would um it, it kind of hits the same in 2023 for a small crossover so mm -hmm. um youtube car spotters guide says question is the hornet rear wheel drive base or front wheel drive it is, is front wheel drive based all wheel drive vehicle front engine front wheel drive um yeah we should go over the basics i guess since this is brand new um, two liter, uh, uh, two liter, sorry, 2.0 T four cylinder engine. It's 200 and, uh, eight, six, sorry, 268 horsepower, almost 300 pound feet of torque. I think all routed through a nine speed automatic transmission. Um, it's, it actually feels pretty quick. You know, it's got that typical, uh, uh, 2.0 T sort of, uh, vibe where great initial acceleration, despite the weight feels, feels awesome. Like getting up to speed on the highway and things like that. It doesn't ever really struggle. I mean, you know, it's, it's 295 pound feet of torque, but it's got plenty of, um, you know, bottom end and top end in the engine. So you feel great. Uh, but never, it only feels kind of a little fast and a little sporty when you're, when you're just getting on it. Right. Yeah. Um, this is a really interesting vehicle and it makes me want to, it makes me want to drive the Alfa Romeo Tenale now even more because these are, uh, you know, they, they share a platform, they share a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and there, we, we talked about it a little bit before when we talked about Tenale, but I think that there was some sort of static inside of the brand because Dodge was getting this vehicle, which had an awful lot of what Alpha is going to be offering with their much more expensive Tonale 
and it's at it's a base of around 30 grand for this um uh, so i i would say it's you know it is on the sporty side of what a car in this class wants to be you know like it it doesn't it doesn't get feel out of its way if you're driving it aggressively i wasn't pushing it super hard as you wouldn't with this but um you know it, it can be kind of fun to drive it's got uh we put my two kids in car seats in the back and my wife and myself in it and drove it for just a day trip we didn't even stay overnight so we didn't have to pack the normal stuff that we would have to but mm -hmm. um a pretty reasonable amount of cargo space for a day trip and things like that for for a family i don't know that we could live in it day in and day out because it still is you know it's still compact um right. cool interior this like neat sort of i don't know if it, i think it's alcantara um finishing on the on these on vented seats um sorry perforated seats they're just heated they're not vented um but they they they're really appealing i would say overall the interior is is maybe a notch above what i would expect um mm -hmm. in a class like this and um yeah i mean not there not a lot to complain it, it hits the hits the points that you need to have um got wireless charging wireless carplay android auto um uh, you know a good uh infotainment system um the one that I have, this is the GT version, which is is all I've seen so far. Um, as I'm starting to see these on the road, has kind of a panoramic sunroof, and you know, it's they're they're really. I think they've they did their homework, and they're really hitting all their marks for what people are shopping for uh, in a vehicle like this, and doing it in a way that, um, I mean, I think it looks good for sure, but it's. But but it's more evident to me based on the conversations that I was having with people that it's at least an interesting thing to look at because people want to know what it what it was right. I yeah I like the design of both of this and the Tonale. Um, they're not I don't know if they're like amazingly good looking, but they're interesting. They're they're mm -hmm. they're certainly something like that's interesting about them. Um, and it's a it's a compact right. It's not like a subcompact. It's definitely a right. true compact yeah, yeah. SUV. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, what is it? It is to do, do, do. It's a uh, hundred. It's a hundred and four inch wheelbase almost, and a hundred and thirty eight inches long. Right. So. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Comfortably in that compact space. Um, they're cheating, I think, a little bit towards um, driver and passenger room over over uh, cargo space. But I would have to do the the breakdown of everything the segment to see where they net out. But again, anecdotally, using it for a week um, in mm -hmm. sort of a, a family style situation. Um, I thought it. I thought it held up really well. Eric, I'm trying to think. Hello. I'm I'm trying to think of like, how does it compare to other compacts in terms of you know sporty driving? Because because I think that's the sort of the angle they were going with, right? They wanted it to be a sportier, yeah, compact. Um, I mean, it's more of the, I, like I I think it's kind of an attitude thing that they're that they're going for. They they. Um, you know, again, like it's, it, it's, it's got good power, like, and, and good acceleration and the handling feels, feels okay. <laughs> I mean, <Yeah. laughs> I, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to be overly enthusiastic about it or, or unenthusiastic about it, but it's not like, it doesn't feel like a Macan, right? It doesn't feel right. like a true yeah, performance yeah. SUV. It doesn't have, you know, a super sophisticated suspension that makes it feel like a sports car when you're driving it really hard or a ton of power. Um, yeah. I mean, it doesn't even have like a, uh, at least the one I'm not sure if it's offered or not, but the one that I had didn't have paddle shifters, right? So like you right. can you can shift up and down on the column if you'd like, but um, uh, or, or sorry, like on the tunnel, but but not mm. uh, not like on the on the steering wheel. So right. I think it's a more practical idea of a sporty kind of crossover, but it's sporty is an is an accurate word, right? Like it's mm. it, it's still I think a commodity vehicle at the end of the day. It's just one that's yeah. got kind of the vibes. Um, which, the Dodge vibes, the Dodge, Dodge bro thing. vibes. <laughs> um, Cola says, uh, and and actually he raises an interesting point. He says uh, Dodge Hornet is a very good SUV and still Rav4, CRV, Tucson, Sportage, CX50, and CX5 are better. Um, it's the the I, I can't I can't weigh in on all those. Those are too many vehicles, and and uh, mm. I think there's a lot to talk about there. Especially this has got slightly more rakish. It's I hate to use the phrase coupe like, but it, it does have that sort of coupe like rear end. So they're they're definitely not maximizing the rear cargo area for like for height for, for packing stuff in there as something like a Rav4 or a CRV might do. That being said, the Mazda comp is really interesting because the 
you know, historically, especially with something like CX-5, what Mazda has always done is take that, we're going to have the athletic version of this vehicle, right? And I think maybe Dodge is, is taking that same approach, um, which is interesting because it was never, it never was a home run idea for Mazda, even though, again, like we in the enthusiast press really like driving those, um, it never completely translated to, to consumer success for those vehicles. Hey, my mom loves her CX-5. <laughs> I, I've always loved the CX-5 too, like, and, and uh, really appreciated it, but. Uh, it is very like, a, it's, it's a definitely a niche uh, in that segment. Like you really have to love it. And my mom has been like Mazda since the CX-7. So she goes back and, and loves that thing. And even my wife, we had a CX-30. So it's, it's weird. The CX-50 and CX-5 are both, like Seth said, both really good, really interesting comps to this. Um, but I think, I don't know, I could be wrong, but I think the Dodge might actually fall into that similar category of like, not a mainstream, not as mainstream as RAV or CRV, but I think it could be like an interesting alternative if you want something that's a little more, you know, interesting than those two. Yep. Yep. Um, and Sapphire asked, and we can just answer. Yeah. Uh, the, the Hornet is also going to get the, the hybrid that, that Tonali gets too. So that adds certainly a very interesting wrinkle um, to that too. Um, lots of lots of comments on the, on the Hornet. Like uh, Sultan Nizi likes the design of it. Um, uh, Brian said the Dodge has about a hundred more horsepower than the Mazda's, which uh, that's fair actually. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. For a second, I thought he was being a little bombastic, but no, you're you're right on. Um, <laughs> especially the two liter one was really underpowered, but you could get with with a manual, so that's worth at least a hundred horsepower in my book. Um, yeah, yeah, we're in a different era. We're in a different era, absolutely, than that. But. Um, yeah, I, I I think that there, this is going to do this vehicle is going to do really well for Dodge. Again, I think that they're 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 able because of the um, economies of scale in Stellantis and because of the um, the development work that that Alfa Romeo did for Tonale. Um, I think Dodge is getting essentially kind of a premium and premium feeling product at a lower price point um, that you know to that that people are going to really enjoy. Right. Yeah. Um, it. It remains to be seen, and I'm slightly hesitant, and this is not me bagging on, on Dodge at all, but it's a brand new vehicle. They both are, right? Um, I do want to see like what happens in first year of manufacturing production and having these be on the road too, because whether it's a Stellantis brand or a Mercedes or, you know, what like uh, a, a Honda, right? Year one for a brand new platform, brand new vehicle is always um, kind of danger zone for getting manufacturing issues sorted out and getting reliability things, uh, kind of, kind of vetted. So, yeah. um, we'll, we'll see what that, see what happens there. Dodge is really good at making badges. That's for sure. That <laughs> Hornet badge looks cool. The Hornet badge is super cool. My kid, my four-year-old couldn't pick it out as a Hornet though. He didn't know what mm. it was. I think he thought it was some, <laughs> some, some letter, but, um, and then we've got we've got a dis we don't have to surface all of it here, but a, a, a fun discussion about the the long gone SRT fours and SRT sixes, um, RIP Dodge and Chrysler uh, stables, <laughs> which were, um, you know, the the caliber SRT four still reigns supreme as the worst torque steer I have ever felt in any vehicle <laughs> in any new vehicle uh, uh, ever. Um, yes, kind of, kind of flawed is, is an understatement. Super fun, ridiculous vehicle. <laughs> the, uh, the neons as well. Although the neons yeah. can be made quite, um, quite racy. Cool. All right. One more to go, you guys. And now moving to something that's not at all racy. It doesn't even have four wheels. Um, I've got a little bit of a backstory to this, but, and, and it's, it's still in my garage. It has not left yet, but I was um, offered a loan of a vehicle from a company that I'd never heard of before called H Hauke. H uh, Bruce was saying Hockey, which I sort of like. Um, it's, a, it's an e-bike uh, from a Chinese manufacturer called the, let's just say Hockey, just for the sake of it. The, the Hockey Cheetah, full suspension. Um, what else? There are a lot of descriptors on the actual one that I had. Um, the Hockey Cheetah full suspension electric bike dual battery version is the one that I have. Right. So, yes, yeah, starting with the box, um, we, have, we have a hero shot, I promise. But um, so the quick background here, because you guys wouldn't know this, but um, 
for many of us in, in automotive media over the last like five years, we've started to get emails from companies that are making, you know, sort of e-mobility products, scooters and bikes in China. They're brands that, that we have not heard of, but they're selling, you know, um, my understanding, most of them are selling almost exclusively online. Um, and they're, they are trying to really aggressively try to um, give you product, to be totally blunt. What they want to do is give you a product and there's like, hey, I'll give you this e-bike and then you can write a review, right? Um, I, that's that's obviously not acceptable. That's not how we handle review coverage. So, um, but I'm really curious about these things too. So I went back and forth with this particular company with the rep there and said, listen, if you want to lend me the bike, I'll send it back to you. I would love to test it just to see what it's like. So. Um, this one, the, uh, this particular bike has got how chi. Okay. How chi is what J dubs is saying. All right. We'll go with how chi cheetah. That's, that's kind of fun. How chi cheetah. How chi cheetah. <laughs> um, uh, the how chi cheetah has got, has got, um, let's see, let me pull the specs. Cause I absolutely do not have these memorized. They're, so they're saying a, uh, 48 volt, 25 amp hour uh, battery option. I think that is the, the optional second battery um, along with a 48 volt, 16 amp hour battery, which is in the tube itself. Um, the 750 watt hub motor and they're claiming um, a, a range of between 65 and 85 miles, which is what really caught my attention on this one and a top speed of 28 miles per hour. Um, now, again, like I, I'm you, you guys are seeing a lot of the photos that I was taking, like in the process of putting it together, because this is brand new territory for us. This is not like um, somebody that we know the Tim that I know really well just delivered a, a car to me. Uh, he doesn't all isn't also just dropping off e-bikes. Um, the company shipped me this bike. It was not assembled or I mean, it was 80 percent assembled and I had to put the rest of it together. Um, but I think it's a, probably a pretty realistic like uh, idea of what you'd have to do if you wanted to take the plunge on one of these brand new brands that you haven't heard of. Um, you're gonna have, you're gonna have a little bit of work, right? So, yeah, Eric. So the price on this one on the site right now is the list price technically is twenty three hundred ninety nine dollars, so twenty four hundred bucks, but. All of their prices, they're doing the thing where all of the prices are already always on sale. So I think that you could buy like, so they're asking $1,949. So just under $2,000 for it. Um, that kind of blew my mind. But like, as I started to dig in and I, I haven't, again, like the, we're going to we're gonna have this written up on Inside EVs um, uh, at some point. But starting to do the due diligence, like if you go to another store, like my local store in Ann Arbor, Michigan that sells e-bikes, does a brisk business. I was looking at their store and looking at some of the bikes that they have and a product that has some of the same specifications in terms of full suspension and fenders and a rack and, you know, comparable, I think, um, uh, powered motor and things like that could be like $6,000. Right. So I, I guess I'm coming away with the idea that this is meant to be a cheap version. Like it, it's meant to be inexpensive. Right. Um, so there's that. Um, hey Seth, yeah. can I ask a question from my no, dad that he course. just texted me because yeah, yeah, apparently yeah. they're watching? Yep. Um, he wanted to know does it have a throttle or is it just pedal assist? Great question, it has a throttle. Um, it and, and this is really weird, Bruce. So you can tell your dad, like, the, 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 the weirdness of this bike is just it's a bottomless well, um, partially because I'm like very, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not up to speed, I'm not schooled in this segment at all. Um, yeah, Eric says I live less than ten miles from work. With one forty degree hill, an e bike would be a, would be great in decent weather. A hundred percent agree. I like I live well. I work from from my home, but but my wife lives less than a mile from her office. Um, it's not particularly hilly hilly around here, but there are some hills. Like if you want to go out on a ride on the river road or something like that, um, it, it seems like a cool way to get around to sort of split the difference between you know, a real bike you would use sort of for exercise, but also for leisure. But this is something that maybe might have a little bit more utility if I wanted to put a kid in like a trailer and pull it or run to the store and put like a six pack on the back because it's got a, a rack or something like that could be could be sort of fun. Um, so on the surface, again, uh, sounds like a lot, but around two thousand dollars, 85 miles of range, maybe can go, you know, up to close 28 miles an hour is what they're saying all seems pretty good relative to that price point. Um, 
the challenge started like trying to put it together. There were no, there are no um, instructions included with the bike at all. I, I texted the PR person or I emailed the PR person to find out if that was normal. And they did say to their credit that this is a, this is one that they were sending to me because I was a reviewer. So maybe it's not a hundred percent representative of what an owner would get. I would also, I would just question like, why would you want the reviewer to not have the instructions to say yeah. So that might be a little bit of smoke and mirrors. And then, um, I mean, all things considered now that I've done it once, like putting this thing together again would be pretty easy. You're essentially putting the front wheel on, um, you know, you don't have to mount brakes or, or, derailleurs or anything like that you have to screw on the handlebars mount the kind of display that it's got put on the fenders and put on the headlight everything's all plugged up you don't have to do anything like um you don't have to wire anything up um, and in fact it came with a full charge too so and then as i said bruce if you go to the to the photo of the whole bike you can see it a little bit there is a battery inside the down tube of the bike, but then also one that kind of like just is just like plunked onto the top of that too. So that top one, you can pull off, you can unlock it and pull it off with a key. So in theory, you could bring that inside and charge that up and not really have to worry about if you're in an apartment or, um, or something like that, you could, you could use that bigger battery, charge that up and that could, you know, theoretically do, uh, do wonders for you. Right. Um, I'll tell you one thing with the first thing that hit me about this is, you're absolutely not going to carry the whole bike up to your apartment because it's, I think the listed weight is 75 or 80 pounds or something like that. I promise you this thing weighs at least a hundred pounds, like, like easily a hundred pounds. It is a, a steel frame. Um, it's huge. Uh, uh, I I'm again, I'm six, five and I didn't even have the seat all the way up to the, to the top most position. It actually struck me as I was riding it. You know how most of the time when you buy a bike, you buy it based on frame size. I mean, you know, you you want a frame that sort of accommodates your size. Um, there's no frame size on this, as far as I can tell. You're just buying a different color or a different battery. So um, somebody a lot smaller than me, I think, would have a really, really difficult time managing this thing uh, because of the weight. Um, so, yeah, interesting on the surface. A little bit difficult to put together. The... The documentation of it, like there's a there's an online owner's manual that is I found out when I finally got access to it that also has uh, the instructions, like some partial instructions for assembling it. Um, it doesn't, for instance, like there is there are two places. The bike comes with four keys, like like uh, two sets of, uh, of two keys. Right. There's no mention of what one set of keys does at all. <laughs> <laughs> so just like there's a for whatever purpose <laughs> well it looks like one of them should maybe lock out the ability to turn it on yeah but it doesn't like mm -hmm. there's there's a there's a lock for the that other that second battery and then there's another lock and the other lock doesn't do anything it just you put it you put the key in the tumbler and it just sort of springs back and nothing happens um bruce you were asking about the throttle your dad was asking about the throttle and i got way sidetracked there's another another like really weird one it has a throttle it has a twist throttle that's in kind of a weird position because if you if the handlebar is that long it's only the first maybe three quarters of an inch of a ring that is that that's twistable for the throttle so weirdly again like large person i have big hands it's like it's a weird amount of effort all the time to hold it down because you're just holding it sort of in in one spot with with kind of like two fingers to get it to go um and then there's on the there's another standalone like button pad that's got you know sort of a power button that eventually you figure out is the power button to turn it on and turn it off um and then there are up arrows and down arrows and you start in zero it looks like it's geared it looks like it's geared to to you know have five gears on the on the e-motor essentially it's not it's a single single speed but the but if you it essentially has different like speed levels that you can put it at. So I quickly found like, well, I'm just going to put it all the way up into five because when mm -hmm. it's in one, maybe it'll top out at like nine miles per hour, two, 12, three, 14 or something like that. And it just goes up the ladder until you get to the top speed. So I don't really know why that's useful. It doesn't, if you go down, like when you're coming up to a stop, it doesn't slow the motor, do anything to, to break the, the motor or anything like that. It's merely like like kind of a speed limiter 
on the on the ability uh, or maybe a power limiter on, on the motor. I'm not actually really sure. And there's no documentation to say what it is. So um, so that part was really strange. Um, I've gone for one ride. <laughs> 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 and this is where it gets sort of funny. I've gone for one ride on, on the bike because, you know, this was last week on a lunch, not, not a super busy day. I was like, I'm going to go have, take this thing to have lunch. And then I'm going to go on a longer ride and see what I could get in terms of range. Right. It's supposed to have 85. I'm, I'm huge. You know, I weigh 245 pounds. There's no way I, I didn't expect it to get, you know, I was going to be really happy if it got half of what it was claiming. Right. 40 miles, I think would be incredible on something like this. Um, so it and then it like the weirdness just started like the the meter that's displaying the um like your you know your odometer and your speed and all of that stuff just started changing weirdly um j dub says the speed restriction is probably useful on certain paths and trails that in, in post speed limits that's a great point that's a great point and and some of this again like just to, to reiterate is going to be a knowledge gap for me because this is not a kind of product that I've tried to review before. So we're just kind of getting into it. So that's, that's an excellent point. I was also thinking that maybe if you had somebody who was a little bit younger, who would want, you, you would want to like cap the speed somehow, but there doesn't seem to be a way to lock it or set it or anything like that. So, um, uh, yeah, so, so maybe there's another way that you want to like self-impose a, a speed limit on too. Um, uh, conversely, to help you keep on bike trails where people are regularly pedaling well over 20 miles per hour, uh, you'll be in the way. Yeah, I don't think so. We'll, we'll get to that. But like I, after my one ride, I don't think that anybody's going to be taking this on trails. It's it's a fat tire bike and a full suspension bike. So you would think that it would have some sort of like, you know, like rough, rough riding capacity. But um, the the end to this very long story is that it it broke about as best I can tell, about 10 miles into the first trip. <laughs> um, and it picked up the world's thinnest nail <laughs> it's not even a nail it's oh, like man. a like a long staple punctured the went all the way through that big knobby tire and into the uh inner tube um Yikes. and and like ruined my rear wheel uh <laughs> but even before we got even before we got to that right like the i was essentially trying to do kind of a range run on this thing and a, a little bit of a range test and the display like the odometer at one point you know, I looked down, I was, I was four miles or five miles. It was weird to me because it was, there's a lot of space, but it was only reading in whole miles. There were no tenths. And then at one point I looked down and it was in tenths. <laughs> like they had, <laughs> tenths had been added, but it, I had gone from reading like a whole seven miles to being 5.9 miles. Right. Then I realized the battery meter, which is just, you know, like kind of an old school one that you would expect from like an, an older software version of a, of a smartphone or something. You know, it's a, a battery with little blocks in it. Um, that was going down. I'm like, well, there's no percentage reading. I couldn't get one, but maybe, you know, you can sort of gauge like where 50% is and things like that. Um, it just started jumping all over. The, like it went from being around 50 to back up to full like around the same time that the, the the units changed and I hadn't pressed anything. I tried to go back through the display to get back to the other ones. And it wasn't, there was nothing that I had any control of. The, the computer itself was just like offering different units. <laughs> right. Um, so, and, and then, you know, like the, the, the long story long, like I, I, I picked up something, blew out the rear tire at about 10 miles per hour, started wobbling like pretty heavily as I was crossing a street and was luckily able to bring it to a stop without, without anything bad happening. was really happy. It was the rear tire, not the front tire. Um, and it does make sense to me. I mean, at the end of the day, you're putting kind of a lot of power through that rear tire again with a heavier rider and a really heavy bike. Nothing there is surprising other than the fact that I, I guess I would have anticipated a little bit more of a robust, uh, tire wall from from something this heavy and, and from a tire a fat tire bike right so yeah uh, that was that was bad listen overall i think that there is some potential again like whether it's uh Hauchi or another company that's that nobody that we don't know about right now i think that there's potential to manufacture something like this in an affordable way and have it um, to the point that Eric was making earlier, be really useful to somebody who's got a short commute or just does, prefers not to drive all of the time. Um, I don't think that this has to be a space that's only owned by blue chip brands. Like we don't know what the future of kind of e-bikes will look like, I guess. But 
right now, this product is, there are just a lot of red flags around it, I guess is, is sort of what I've discovered. Um, I, I do want to go back. Like, I think it's going to be pretty easy to patch the tire and, and fill it back up. And I don't think that there was real damage done to the wheel um, in the process. So at least that was pretty robust. So I hope to do that and bring it uh, a, a better and more complete version of a review and understand exactly like kind of what the real range is and things like that when I'm done. But um, yes, not a, not a smooth process, not a, not a user-friendly process with my first e-bike. Well, I'll say this. Uh, e-bikes, when I first started working in this industry, were like on the up and up. This was, I don't know, 10 years ago at this point. Sure. E-bikes were like the new hot thing. And then they sort of just faded and everyone got on the, the scooters and, you know, a bunch of other weird mobility stuff. And now it seems like they're sort of making a little bit of a comeback, e-bikes. Yeah. But I've always liked I've always liked the idea, like, especially if you live in a small neighborhood where you don't have to go very far, you just hop on the e-bikes, fully charged up and you just go. Um, that's much easier than just than getting in a car to go, you know, two miles or whatever. For sure. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, this seems like seems like they have a little bit to work out here maybe like I, it could just be like a pre-pro you know kind of bike pre-production bike maybe but um yeah so i'll chime in here real quick my parents have two e-bikes one for my dad to ride one for my mom to ride and they go on like 20 plus mile trips on trails like every two weeks and they love it because oh, wow. you know it if there's a hill you you know you just Turn the assist up and you go up the hill and it's easy and but you can also cruise and stuff like that so at you know as a trail thing and especially for them like go out and do stuff as a couple it's it's perfect for them that, now granted mm -hmm. they don't commute on them they specifically sure. you know they've got a bike carrier on their van and take it to trails but there are some fantastic trails around the country at least in ohio um so yeah I, are they on fat tire bikes chris so i was i told my dad we were going to be talking about this they're on like a cruiser type like they okay. don't, it doesn't have like a full suspension or anything yeah. like that yeah. um but you know for a trail you know they're paved or maybe it's like you know gravel or something like that it's not off-road at all but yeah yeah it works really well for them for, you know i just give some exercise and, yeah i just know that this style of like forget about e-bikes but but like fat tire bikes in general have been have been popular for a while and they were you know that this was the thing forever ago too when people wanted to like make a bike like a beach cruiser kind of a thing like that you put a big tire on it and sort of uh you know make it make it a little bit easier to go on and off sand and things like that but um yeah i like from from recreation all the way through actually being like kind of a second vehicle uh, in a lot of cases i do think that they have huge potential and i'm 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 interested to do more of this too right like this is not a one-shot thing like i want to try some more and i really hope my, my real goal here is like you know we're going to get into the stage two i'm sure at inside evs we've already done a little bit of this where we're we are going to be going out and find the the bigger manufacturers that are doing this the more again sort of like well-known names that are that are building these things like i i think that it's it makes total sense to review those first and and more seriously but i think it's really interesting to see like there are going to be a couple of these up-and-comers too that have something that like definitely outperforms its its price point or your expectations of it too um I, i'm just i'm just pretty sure that this this uh first first one is not uh at least not today so there's um marquez brownlee who's a big tech youtuber yeah yeah he, yeah. Uh, he had a video series a few months ago where it was, he basically just tested every weird product that he got pitched to him. Right. And now I, I just want to see you do that with every weird mobility product that anyone pitches to you. You'll be like on a, an electric unicycle or something and just. <laughs> well, I've got a scooter. I've got a scooter coming in. I don't oh, know perfect. Plan, and I don't exactly uh, know when. They told me that they were going to ship it when it was available, but they don't even, they didn't even have a website. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> like like That's the website I, I i needed to wait for the website to launch before i could even see the name of the brand for the first time so like we wow. are talking about brand new brand new here um yeah. and we get a lot of those like early those early pitches uh, uh certainly through inside evs because you know people w really would like to have their product on that on that platform so yeah um, yeah it'll be fun to do it again just to reiterate for the audience at home and to make it really clear uh <laughs> We're I'm, I'm, we're sending all of these back, <laughs> or I suppose if they won't let me send it back, we'll do some sort of raffle or giveaway or something like that. But um, 
but not a not a pay for play situation, which I do think that they've done. If you go back and look through, like, I'm not gonna like throw anybody under the bus, but like, you know, there are a few like YouTubers or maybe influencers who are who are just I think happy to get the product for free. That is not the case here. We want to give an honest review um, and have that be the expectation. But um, yeah, it will be fun to to do uh, this on a little bit more of a regular basis. So mm -hmm. cool. Oh man! All right. Well, that's an awful lot of e-bike for our uh, of e-bike for our car podcast. Uh, <laughs> we'll probably leave it there. Um, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks for all the interaction and the questions, you guys. If you think of more questions after the fact, go ahead and leave a comment in YouTube on the YouTube uh, page, and we will answer as best we can. Um, and then uh, expect us to be back next week, Thursday, two thirty Eastern, eleven thirty a.m. Uh, Pacific time, um, with more Motor One Test Car Happy Hour. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody.